from Turner Sports and NBA TV analyst Stu Jackson. How are you, Stu? Rich, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm do- well. You know what? I'm I'm you know I'm one of those Knicks fans that enjoyed watching you coach the team back in the day and wondering what the direction of this franchise is. What is the direction of this franchise, Stu? Well, uh, it's difficult to tell. Um, you know, at, at this juncture, but um, you know, Phil will have another couple years to try to revamp. Uh, this roster and get it to a point where it's uh, competitive. I think going into this season, though, Rich, I think all of us who are Knicks fans really felt that this particular collection of players would, in fact, be able to compete uh, at a minimum for a playoff spot, but it didn't happen. Uh, So now we go back to the drawing board. Well, I mean, what is the drawing board, right? I mean, uh, you got Noah's contract sitting there. Uh, I guess Derek Rose, you're going to either have to max him out or let him go. Um and then Carmelo, who's going to take somebody at his advancing age for the amount of picks that they'd probably want back, Stu? Yeah, no, it's not going to be easy, Rich. Uh, I, I don't didn't even mean to sound cavalier about it because I, you mentioned three huge hurdles in terms of you know truly revamping not only the roster from a player standpoint, but just uh, being able to deal assets on the open market, uh, given the um, you know contract structure, particularly with Carmelo. I mean, you, you, you hit it on the head. I mean, given his number and where he's at right now, to get a taker on that contract and at the same time to get Carmelo to – you know, uh, relieve his no trade clause. That's going to be a tall order. Currently, at this point, Noah is damaged goods, and uh, you know, uh, you know, with Rose, I, I think they do part ways as well. So uh, we'll we'll see. Well, when, when uh, the playoffs begin, um, this this topic of discussion that I'm about to bring up with you um, should go away unless Cleveland has to take on the the Celtics. Uh, in the Eastern Conference Finals and play a Game 7 on the road, which they brought uh, on themselves by essentially taking a knee on the one seed because they decided to rest their players in the same manner that the Brooklyn Nets decided to rest their players in a crucial game for the seeding against the Chicago Bulls, and then the Bucks and the Hawks rested their players. And it's just, it's gotten absurd, this resting of players, Stu, and you spent many, many years sitting there on the competition committee um, at the NBA. What do you think the front office folks, Adam Silver and everybody else there in New York City are thinking about how to fix this problem? Well, first of all, I, you know, having some experience, I can tell you that these types of issues, and this one's no different, Rich, are priority number one. Um, and if you listen to Adam Silver carefully, um, you know, at this most recent Board of Governors meeting, uh, to me, he made an appeal uh, to the owners, to the partners, the 30 partners, uh, on the basis of respecting the game and you know, agreeing that the clear understanding that there's nothing more important than the fans of the NBA. And in light of that, um, you know, there has to be some compliance to their existing policy, Rich, which is that a team is required to report to the NBA league office when they're going to rest players. And I think that that policy had not been adhered to. So there's a redoubling down of the effort to make sure everybody's in compliance with the existing policy, but also to discuss the potential policy of not resting players during road games and not resting players during, during nationally televised games. Uh, collectively, um, you know, with those three things, you could have a policy that may work. But I do think that, you know, Adam Silver and the NBA are taking the other uh, approach in terms of lengthening the season one week. And it doesn't sound like much, but by lengthening the season one week, you'll decrease the density of games per week and perhaps provide some incentive uh, not to rest players as frequently. So, I mean, I don't think any one thing is going to cure the problem. Uh, They're not making a hard, fast rule, but instead adjusting their policies and also lengthening the season, and that may do the trick. But clearly, uh, this is something that's got to be curtailed. So uh, one week after this message is delivered to the clubs by the commissioner, you're saying a 61-loss team in Brooklyn decided not to put their two best players on a plane to Chicago in a game that requires competitive uh, a, a competitive uh, nature for yeah, not just the Bulls, but a fan base in Miami that's sitting there coming back from yeah. 20 games under 500 to try and make a, a to try and make it to the playoffs. And, and Brooklyn can't even be bothered to put Jeremy Lin 
and and Lopez on a plane, Stu? No, it, it's awful. And, you know, it begs the question, and all jokes aside, what are they resting for? Uh, you know, the, the Brooklyn Nets, that is, yeah. next October. So, uh, again, this is work in progress. It's something that will have to be agreed upon and vetted out amongst the owners. I suspect that will happen over the summer so that they can come up with a clear-cut policy on how they're going to handle this. But that was not, you know, a good look on the last day of the season, uh, particularly in light of the importance of that game, um, you know, within the playoff race. Yeah, I mean, I guess you, can, you can't you can blame the Bucks and the Hawks for resting their guys. And I guess no. even with the horse out of the barn with the one seed, uh, you can't blame the Cavs for just, okay, let's give LeBron the, this night off too and we'll give him the full week of rest. Um, and he's home too, right? So it's a home crowd that he was in front of. I guess you can't blame those. But the, the Nets one is a total head scratcher. And, you know, I saw Eric Spolstra after after his game and he he sat there in silence for like 20, 25 seconds. He took it pretty hard, Stu, not making yeah. the playoffs last night. You know yeah. when it when it yeah. all comes down to it. So uh, let me uh, ask you this: uh, Who who which is the team that you think has the best shot at derailing the uh, Golden State Warriors for what everyone believes is going to be them hoisting the Larry O'Brien Trophy in June? You know, at, at this juncture, to me, the best team that has the best shot is the San Antonio Spurs, and that's before they even get to the finals. I, I, outside of that, uh, I, I don't think there's a team currently that is capable of beating them four times in seven games. And the reason I say that is the Golden State Warriors this year, as opposed to last year, have gone through some adversity they perhaps didn't um, face during their historic season last year. And that is, you know, you, they enter the season, Rich. They, you know, Steve Kerr loses his front line with Bogut, Azili and Spates as backups. They lose Barbosa. They lose Harrison Barnes, all in the interest of adding Kevin Durant. You know, they sputtered out of the gate, didn't play well, had trouble integrating them. Then over the course of the season, he loses Kevin Durant for 20 games to injury, 19 straight. They had a period in the season back a month ago or a month and a half ago where they lost five out of seven. So they had to navigate through the dog days of the NBA season. And the net result of all this is now that Kevin Durant has returned is that they are still the best offensive team in, in the, uh, in the league and the second best defensive team in, in, in the league. So, you know, you look at their point differential as comparison to other teams in the league, their point differential, which I think is a great indicator in terms of just how effective a team's performance is over the course of the regular season, uh, their differential is 11.6. The next closest team is the San Antonio Spurs at 7.2. That is a wide gap, Rich, which mm. tells me that even among the elite teams in the NBA, they are far the most elite. And, you know, barring injury, uh, barring something crazy that happens, like we get Draymond Green kicks and all that kind of things that may psychologically derail them, I, I see them with an easy path to the finals. And dare I say, I, I just don't think that uh, there's a team out there that's capable of beating them four times the way they're currently constructed. And Stu, uh, we're we're two weeks from the NFL draft, so um, you know the NBA draft is is further away. But that said, the uh, what are you hearing already about Lonzo Ball? Uh, are you hearing teams that are, are, are kicking the tires on him or staying away from him because they don't want the dad in the mix? Or, or is this just a, a large, low-hanging fruit festival in the, uh, in the sports media in regards to this man? Yeah, it's, interesting. it's an interesting question. But, you know, one of the things that happens when a young man transitions from college to the NBA, and, uh, you know, I used to be in charge of the Undergraduate Advisory Committee, which would actually advise some of these undergraduates mm -hmm. uh, on their draft position as they come into the NBA. And one of my standard lines, uh, as I spoke to, you know, these young men as well as their advisors and family, I, I used to say to their family, now you realize in the NBA, they're not going to take your call. OK, and, and I say that as a backdrop to the fact that I don't think that LeVar Ball is, is going to really factor into a uh, team's decision to draft Lonzo unless, you know, attitudinally or, you know, Lonzo has the same outlook as his father, which would be an issue, I think, competitively uh, over the long haul. But that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, based on people that I've talked to, my own observations is the young man is, you know, very humble. Uh, obviously, he's highly skilled. 
uh, has some leadership ability, has the ability to make other players on the floor better. To that point, LeVar Ball is right. But I do not think that the father will be a deterrent if an M- M- NBA team thinks that investing in this young man is the right way to go. Stu, thanks for the time. Really appreciate it. We'll have you back on uh, during the playoffs and obviously as we approach the draft. Yeah, no, I'd love to. Always appreciate it. Thanks. You. you got it. That's Stu Jackson at Stu Jackson 32. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.